Good morning, again. Uh, Pastor Wade is out of town, so you're stuck with me this morning, once again. Uh, this is a standalone message. The title of my message is Gratitude is an Attitude. Uh, if you're new to Where the Redeemer, we usually walk through the Bible, book by book, verse by verse. We just got finished with the book of Jude. However, we're taking a break of uh, expositional, uh, exegetical preaching uh, for the month of, what, the last two here in two Sundays in November and then the month of December uh, as this is a standalone and then we begin our Advent series, uh, which is all topical, all right? Uh, we're so glad you're with us this morning. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, I need this sermon, so I'm grateful that I get to preach it uh, this morning, um, it's always interesting, right around this time of the year, uh, there's always these like cliche sermon topics, right? And so I get to preach one of the most cliche sermon topics about Thanksgiving, right? Uh, where else could I go? I couldn't go, I couldn't go wrong doing a, t a sermon on Thanksgiving, being that it's Thanksgiving week, right? Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, as, you, as you may or may not know, is a national holiday, right? Uh, that we currently, uh, that currently Americans of all types have mixed feelings about. I mean, you, you just bring up Thanksgiving in any conversation, and it could turn into uh, anything from, uh, is it just about turkey and stuffing your face and filling our bellies and watching some football and hanging out with family? Is that all Thanksgiving is for you? Maybe, maybe, maybe you are all already thinking, oh, Thanksgiving. It's that sketchy time of the year where we question our history, right? Did the pilgrims <laughs> and the Wampanoag really sit down and have a meal together? I mean, didn't the pilgrims do some terrible things to our Native American people? Did they sit around and eat corn and venison and be just, you know, thankful? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know about you, but growing up, I, every year was, you know, Right around this time, we learned about cutting out, how to cut out black construction paper to make a pilgrim hat, and then we cut out colorful things to make a headband, and then we'd all interact and, and recreate the first Thanksgiving, which, by the way, as a country, we didn't celebrate till centuries later as Thanksgiving, as we traditionally know it today. So who knows, right? Like, I mean, I wasn't there. <laughs> I wasn't there in 1621 to know whether or not Everybody got along. And if you know anything about Thanksgiving meals at your house, I'm sure that not everybody got along, even at the first Thanksgiving. Many of the pilgrims and those who came over on the Mayflower didn't get along. So uh, I can't imagine there'd be a completely festive time there. But maybe for you, Thanksgiving marks uh, the beginning of a holiday season, season that is full of loneliness and frozen meals and binging your favorite TV shows. Whatever and however you approach the day the nation sets aside to pardon a turkey, we can all agree that we could use more gratitude in our lives. Amen? You see, gratitude is this idea of, and it actually comes from giving thanks. It's an act of giving thanks. And it's scientifically proven to increase your joy. Did you know that? Did you know that gratitude is scientifically proven to increase your joy. You see, scientifically, the positive effects of gratitude have been proven for a variety of purposes. For example, in his book, The Upward Spiral, Using Neuroscience to Reverse the Course of Depression, One Small Change at a Time, very lengthy title, if you will, Alex Korb, a PhD, talks about how gratitude boosts the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin, and the hormone oxytocin, all associated with well-being and having a positive outlook on life. So, rooted in you having deep joy, everlasting joy, is what are you going to do with gratitude? What are you going to do about giving thanks? And so I've used two words in my title, right? Gratitude is an attitude. Well, what is an attitude? I say it to my, my kids all the time. Hey, everybody got to choose an attitude. You better choose the right one, right? Change your attitude. Get a better attitude. What is this word attitude? 
Well, attitude is, is basically a s settled way of thinking or feeling for someone or something. So it's, how we, it's not just based in how we think, but it's a settled way of how we think. But it also goes deeper into how we feel about something or someone. What's, what's interesting is the Bible has much to say about gratitude, about giving thanks. In fact, uh, giving thanks to God is of such fundamental importance that the Bible mentions the fa failure to do so as part of the basis for God's judgment against mankind. We read this in Romans chapter 1. So I wanted us to consider this morning some scriptures. I think this is the best place uh, for us to really unlock uh, gratitude is here amongst God's people around the scriptures with Jesus at the center because he is the wellspring of our joy. I'm, my aim this morning is to, to kind of push you in that direction anyway. Psalm 95 verses 1 and 2 say this, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Psalm 104 says, Enter the gates with thanksgiving and its courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. So I want to submit this morning that there is a deep connection even found within the Psalms. What, by the way, this is just a tiny sample of how the Psalms connect giving thanks and our joy. But I, wanna, I want to uh, submit to you this morning that there's a deep connection between gratitude and joy. Thanksgiving is the key, and I don't mean the, the calendar date that we celebrate Turkey. I mean Thanksgiving, the giving of thanks, is the key that unlocks the treasure trove of true gems of joy. Tim Challey's a blogger, author, and church elder, wrote in a post from November 20. Uh, 16, he wrote these things. It's ironic that during the holiday season, when we talk about joy the most, it seems to be the hardest to find. Would, would, would you all agree with Tim on that? Would you say, we talk about joy the most, the holiday season, it's the hardest to find. You see, the holiday, he goes on, the holidays are stressful. We have a lot to do. We are pressed for time and money. Uh, family conflicts tend to, to rise to the surface. But even in the midst of these things, we can remain genuinely joyful, he says. This sounds paradoxical. But as Bill Farley discusses in his recent book, The Secrets of Spiritual Joy, it is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Tim says that this means that for, the, that for Christians, there's a joy that comes without price, prepaid as it were. Joy is one of the first three fruits first three fruits of the Spirit listed in Galatians 5, along with love and peace. Farley explains in his book that spiritual joy really is and, and how we can obtain it. Spiritual joy doesn't necessarily mean some kind of 24-7 cork-popping effervescence. Sometimes it does feel like exuberant happiness, but at other times it flourishes, even when our present circumstances are bitter and we don't feel good. This is true joy. So let's explore this treasure trove a little bit. Come explore with me. The treasure trove of Scripture. We find the gems of true joy. Well, I think we have to first by ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about giving thanks? Uh, thanksgiving is, a, is the natural expression of thanks in response to blessings, protection, or love. Uh, thanksgiving is never used to manipulate God. It's never used as a tool to manipulate God. It, thanksgiving was ne is not supposed to be, or, or it's never supposed to be co coerced or, or, or fabricated in one's mind. In other words, you can't just uh, fake thankfulness. You can't thank or fake thanksgiving. Uh, rather, gratitude is a joyful commitment to, of one's personality to God. I, I would ask this question, why are you downcast, oh, my soul? Well, it's be probably because I haven't been expressing gratitude. It's probably because I haven't been thankful. This is what we find in the Old Testament. You see, and we unlock the, the, the Old Testament. We find gratitude to God was the only condition in which life could be enjoyed for Israel. Every aspect for Israel of creation provided evidence of God's lordship over all of life. 
over and over and over again in the Old Testament, specifically, specifically in the Psalms, we find, give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. God's people are made to worship, and God's people's worship is marked by thanksgiving. In fact, I would say it's the root cause of their praise and their worship. And it's good for us to remember now, in the year 2022. I mean, come on, let's be honest with each other. For the last three years, have you not wanted to just check out of this world? Like, come on. Like, just get it over with. Like, can this be over? I remember uh, uh, Pastor Paul Whaley reminded me of this on Thursday in his, his talk he gave. It, it, it was something I wanted to share with you. It's like 2020, we were all just sitting there in the pandemic, right? Like, we don't even want to talk about it anymore. It's like a bad thing. We don't, uh, don't mention it, right? But we were sitting there going, can this just be over? Two more weeks, and it'll be over, right? Two more months, it'll be over, right? Like, just can this year get over? Oh, it's 2021. Finally, we're here. Can 2021 just get over with? Can 2021 just be done? And now here we are in November of 2022. We're still talking about some of the same things. There's still inner strife in some of our families and relationships. There's national strife. There's, there's all kinds of brokenness and problems in our world. And we might find ourselves going, can we just get through this? Can this just be over? And I will, I will submit to you that the Lord says, give thanks. Give thanks to me. Enjoy me in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of all things, all these bad things. Enjoy me. You see, I feel that gratitude is the spark that will light the fire for worship. It's what the, it's what the Israelites really, most of their praise came from. They would see the magnificence of the universe and give thanks to God. To give thanks to Yahweh for his creation. When they received good news, they gave thanks for his goodness. When they received bad news, they gave thanks and trusting that he is just. You see, in the Old Testament, this word, tada, which is really funny because we say, tada, right? But toda. To give thanks, to praise. It comes from another Hebrew word, yada, which means to cast or throw. This idea of giving thanks is this idea of of heaping or throwing or casting, uh, of affirming and confessing the name of the Lord. Namely, his goodness for his character and what he has done for us. Uh, This usage is mostly found, as I said, in the Psalms. Thanksgiving is always, or this giving or casting or confessing of thanks, is always accompanied by cries and shouts of joy, music and singing. We see this in the time of Nehemiah. In fact, Nehemiah commissioned two large choirs to, uh, to assemble and render thanksgiving. Can you imagine it? Brian, imagine with me. Choirs. And they're all just giving thanks joyfully, right? I think sometimes it's missing in our Christian worship is the joy of our salvation. This is not a knock on our worship time. What I'm saying is in the Christian church, oftentimes, yes, we sing songs that are full and rich of gospel truth, but it is oftentimes joyless. And I don't mean we've got to be running around the building with our arms raised, shouting, carrying on as if we're madmen. What I'm saying is that if the gospel is true and it has penetrated not only our minds, but our hearts as well, and it has taken root from that seed of the gospel truth, there should be joy coming out of our mouth in thanksgiving, casting thanks to the Lord for what he has done. In fact, uh, Old Testament saints would put some of us New Testament saints to shame in this regard. You see, Israel would give thanks to the Lord because he's good, just simply because he's good, and he works on behalf of his people. They would give thanks to the Lord because not only was he good, but he expresses himself in his works as a good and caring and loving God. Psalm 106.1, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is a, a, a refrain that you see throughout 
the Old Testament, specifically, as I've said in the Psalms, give praise to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. There were Levitical instructions given to the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Specific sacrifice for thanksgiving. Think about that, y'all. These special sacrifices were given to express uh, appreciation to the Lord for things like deliverance from illness and enemies, deliverance from troubles of various kinds, deliverance from death. These special thanksgiving sacrifices were made just for uh, any blessing received, forgiveness of sin, answers to prayer. So I would say, I would submit to you that, that within Israelite culture, there was a deep understanding and, yea, a deep practice of thanksgiving. And they knew if they were thankful, the goal, <laughs> the gain for them was joy. Joy, not just a superficial happiness in circumstances like you got a new toy, but a, a, a deep, everlasting spiritual joy because they were thankful for what the Lord had done. I think um, one of our issues uh, in the church, one of, uh, like, and I don't mean we're the Redeemer Church, I mean like the church in broad in general, is that we can look back and look at the psalmist, we can look back in the Old Testament, and we can get all this inspiration about, oh man, they were giving thanks and praising the Lord, and, and they got joy out of it. Um, we look at that and we go, well, that was for them. And I got to tell you, church, it's for us. They had half of the story. They didn't even have the full story. And they were jubilant in their praise. You see, Jesus comes, and he gives us the rest of the story. We receive to us in the story of Jesus that we are about to spend four weeks looking at this idea that salvation has come from the Lord and his name is Jesus. But I, I not only think that it's because we have lost sight of the true uh, story or the good news of the gospel. It's not just that. We're at war. We're at war for our joy. Every day when you and I get up, we're in the trenches for our, our joy. You see, Jesus even says the thief comes only to steal, kill, kill and destroy. Paul reminds us, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is our attitude, being taken captive for Christ. Our thought about who God is and what he has done, namely on on our behalf, in Christ Jesus. Dear church, this is the attitude that should be in you. That was, that was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself and took on the form of a man and died in obedient death on the cross. This is the same attitude that should be in us, the church. This isn't about us. This is about Christ. This isn't about my preference. This is about Christ. When I live, I live as one crucified to Christ with Christ, crucified to my flesh, crucified to my sin. It is not about me. It is about Christ and what Christ can do through me. And therefore, I must, I must have an attitude of gratitude. Because you see, dear Christians, we are reminded that in the cross, with the cross, we're reminded that we are so dependent upon the Lord. Can you get to heaven apart from Jesus? That should be a resounding no. We're a gospel church, right? So I'm going to ask it again. Can you get to heaven apart from Jesus? No. no. This, if this doesn't spark in you thanksgiving, I don't know what will. The fact that you have been made right in relationship with the creator of the universe who has created you with a purpose, who's created you to worship him, he says to you, my dearly beloved, I love you because of what Christ has done. 
One of my, one of my all-time favorite scenes in the New Testament. After Jesus heals 10 lepers and only one comes to offer praise and thanksgiving, Jesus asks this question. We're not all 10 clean, cleansed. Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Uh, it's a reminder to me that we can be healed by Jesus. We can even say emphatically, no way can anybody else get to heaven except through Jesus, and then we don't give him thanks. I, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer or a Nelly, negative Nelly here, but so oftentimes I'm with the nine. I'm with the nine. I'm more worried about, I got to get home and tell my friends that I'm no longer a leper. I, I'm free from my leprosy. You guys know what leprosy is, right? Like leprosy was the worst disease you could have. You couldn't worship. You couldn't be around your family. You had to live in a leper colony as your skin rotted off. It was terrible. Of course, they're going to be like, I'm going to go tell the priest that I'm clean so I can go home. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily, you know, have ill will towards the other nine, but this fact that Jesus even marks it as, weren't ten cleansed? Only one came back to offer thanks and praise? What about this? He would regard the same sentiment when speaking to, of, the, the woman, uh, to, of the woman who washed his feet. You know, the gathering of the Pharisees, they're all having dinner together, and this woman comes in, uh, she's definitely not, she's a woman of the street, right? And, and the Pharisees know it. They're like, if he only knew who this woman was, and she comes in and she breaks her alabaster box and she starts washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping his feet, which, by the way, would have been nasty, just so you know, he ain't wearing J's, right? He ain't out there with comfortable sandals and socks on his feet like some of you white folks wear. He's not there with clean feet. He would have been walking around in pretty gross feet. And here he is getting his feet washed by her hair. And the Pharisees are sitting there, and Jesus knows the intent of their heart because he's Jesus. And, he, and they're sitting there, and they're like, Psh, how can he let her touch him? This is Brian Metz's paraphrase. And Jesus, knowing the intent of their heart, says, man, she's, she's been forgiven so much. She loves much. Look at how much she loves. I think about those stories because I want to be like that woman who gives up everything, reputation, gives up uh, the glory of her hair, gives up a, way, a, a year's wage to wash and anoint the Lord's feet. Man, that would be amazing. Her love of Jesus being born out of her knowledge of the abundance and darkness of her sin. And here the Lord is being mindful of her. Why? Why? Well, I really believe that you and I need to, to not just have head knowledge about this, but we, we really need to let it sink into our hearts and think about for a moment not just the inspiration of the Old Testament saints who, who only had part of the story. We need to think about what Jesus has done. We need to think about this cross. We have this better perspective as we look at the cross. And I would say even look, look at the wounds of Jesus. Look at the crown of thorns. Look at the nails piercing our dear Lord's hands and feet. If we look through the filter of the fountain filled with blood, pouring from Emmanuel's veins. When we look at the cross, we may, find it, we may find it so very easy to cast our gratitude towards Jesus. I love the idea of casting our crowns at the feet of Jesus, something we would think here on earth is so precious. I used to never understand that song. Like, why would we cast crowns at the feet of Jesus? It's because he is so worthy. He's so worthy of the very thing that it would be our glory to have. He is so worthy. By the way, our crown is going to be made of the works of, that God has worked in us. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works. And when our works come together in heaven, it will be a crown upon our heads. And we're going to take that beautiful crown that we, we earned, right? Yeah, okay. And we're going to take that crown and we're going to cast it at the feet of Jesus as an act of worship and praise Oh, dear saints, if we, if we would just think upon Jesus, 
even in the, the hustle and bustle of the holiday season, if we would think about Jesus, if we, would ex- if we would think about how every good and perfect gift comes flowing down from the Father who is the good Father of, of lights, the good and perfect giver of good gifts. But not only all of these good things that we get from the Father, but namely Jesus, but all of the bad things that he has in our life that he allows to happen so that we will be conformed to the image of Christ. Paul writes about this uh, in his writings over and over. The Apostle Paul believed that we can rejoice in our sufferings and be grateful in our trials. In fact, he wrote about it as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write about it because the expression of gratitude is tied so closely to a response of faith. Paul encouraged believers to give thanks in all things. He commanded Christians to pray with thanksgiving in the name of Christ who has made all thanksgiving possible. In in his teaching on how to celebrate the Lord's Supper, Paul specified that Christians should give thanks just as the Lord had given thanks. Seven times we see Jesus giving thanks in the New Testament, just so you know. He models thanksgiving to the Father for us. When we think about the things that kill our joy, and I know some of you are sitting there going, man, preacher, you don't know what I got going on. We think about those things that kill our joy. I believe that they're rooted in in some form of entitlement, self-seeking, selfishness, or an ingratitude for the everyday blessings given to us by the giver of all good and perfect gifts. I want to remind you, I want to remind you, I'm not talking about Thanksgiving the day. I'm not talking about turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and green bean casserole and specially made mac and cheese. I'm not talking about that day, that national holiday that actually draws its concept from the Bible. I'm not talking about that day. I'm talking about truly casting thanks to the Lord. When we think about Thanksgiving, do we think about, do we think about Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12? When the builders lay the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. This is their song. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout. And they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. In fact, the Bible regularly connects this kind of joy, this kind of joy that I am talking about. He, the Bible connects it with sorrow, with trials, with affliction, The people of Israel didn't just walk into building the house for the Lord. There was bloody battles. There were times where they uh, sacrificed their bodies in order to build the house of the Lord. It's not something that just came easy. They weren't throwing up a mobile home for the Lord. They were building a a a temple. You and your life, Perhaps you need to think of James chapter 1, verse 2, that exhorts us. Count it all joy when, not if, you meet trials of various kinds. And Paul described himself as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Then in the next chapter, Paul says that he was afflicted, yet overflowing with joy. Afflicted, yet overflowing with joy at the same time. That guy, Bill Farley, that I talked about earlier, he says that spiritual joy is like a heat-seeking, heat-seeking missile. It pursues those who walk in the Holy Spirit. This walking involves a number of spiritual disciplines, but foremost among them is the discipline of gratitude and thanksgiving. Do you even consider gratitude and thanksgiving a spiritual discipline? You should. How many of you guys, and you don't have to show your hands, just in your heart, how many of you work out or you run? or you have some sort of conditioning program. I'm not going to embarrass those who don't, so don't raise your hands, okay? 
But we oftentimes find ourselves beating our bodies into submission, as Paul says, for the sake of uh, physical health and well-being. Discipline and spiritual discipline is of the same kind of way. Um, I remember when I played basketball a long time ago, Jedi, um, as you can tell by my physique, um, one of the things the coach always had us do is shoot free throws. Um, if, if you're not a sports person, that's okay. Whatever you do that has repetition in it so you can get better at that very thing that you're trying to do, and apply it here, okay? I don't want to isolate anyone. But the idea is you stand behind the free throw line and you shoot them and you shoot them and you shoot them and hopefully you learn how to shoot them correctly so that they'll go in because free throws are an important part of basketball. It's just like that for anything, though. I mean, I'm sure there's tasks at your work that they want you to do a certain way. Or perhaps there's things that you want your children to learn how to do a certain way. And, and the best way for them to learn that without it even becoming uh, something they have to think about anymore is repetition. In fact, over and over and over in the Bible, it talks about putting the word of the Lord on the frontlets of your face, of your doorposts and, and your uh, mantles and, and everywhere you could see the word of the Lord. Why? So that you would, uh, would notice and know what the word of the Lord is, but you would also hide it in your heart. This is why I would submit to you that putting the cross before us, putting what Jesus has done before us over and over daily, I would say probably three times a day for some of us who need to be reminded of the good news of the gospel, that we are not our own, we were bought with a price, will bring us satisfying joy because in it we will have fruit of thanksgiving, we will have fruit of gratitude, and our attitudes will change. I want to remind you that if you don't have an attitude of gratitude, I, I want to warn you. I want to warn you. Billy Graham writes, ingratitude is a sin. Just as surely as is lying or stealing or immorality or any other sin condemned by the Bible. One of the Bible's indictments against rebellious humanity is that although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. An ungrateful heart uh, Graham says, is a heart that is cold toward God and indifferent to his mercy and love. It is a heart that is, has forgotten how dependent we are on God for everything. I, I want to remind you, as I said already, we are dependent on God for everything. Richard Hooker, a very ancient saint, um, Puritan, wrote these things concerning the blessing, blessings of God. Whether they tend unto this life or the life to come, there is great cause why we should delight more in giving thanks than in making requests for them. Inasmuch as the one has pensiveness and fear, the other always joy attached. The one belongs to those who seek, the other to those who have found happiness. Those who pray do not, but yet so. Those who give thanks declare what they have reaped. In our thankfulness, we are actually reaping what we've prayed for. And in our thankfulness, we're just, we're just acknowledging what God has done. It's that simple. It's that simple. And I believe we have many reasons to give thanks to God. And yet, it's far too rare a practice for many. In fact, I would say our culture, our culture, and maybe we're seeped in it too. Maybe it's not just our culture. Maybe it's, it's my heart. My heart is full of complaining and grumbling. And it comes far too easily for me. I would say that rather than looking at what is lacking in our lives, maybe we should, we should learn to thank God for everything, realizing that God owes us nothing and yet has graciously given us all things in Christ Jesus. God owes me nothing. And yet he's given me everything. Let us be reminded by the prisoner in chains. We, we read the New Testament. We read Paul's letters and we oftentimes think, oh, he's just some scholar sitting somewhere comfortable by the sea. And the truth is, is he's in a prison cell, a Roman prison. And he writes this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness 
be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Dear one, are you anxious? Are you fearful? Give thanks. It is the weapon for our warfare. Perhaps you, you need to hear this from the prisoner. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Maybe you need to hear it over and over again. He writes in Colossians chapter 3, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns, psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the, to God the Father through him. Whether you eat or drink, give thanks to the Lord. An attitude of gratitude starts with thanking God for who he is and what he is, has done. And it permeates into our lives through the practices and disciplines to help us fight for joy. And that's what I want for you. That's what I want for me is for us to fight for our joy. Fight for joy in your gratitude. Fight for joy in your thanksgiving. Why don't we have more thanksgiving songs? Have you thought about it? I mean, there's songs out there. A couple of new stars are, you know, writing songs about gratitude. But you, you never hear, hey, check out this album on Thanksgiving. And I don't mean the turkey day. I mean truly giving thanks to the Lord. I did a Google search. I was like, hey, are there really worship songs dedicated to Thanksgiving? There are some out there, just so you know. They're just not well known, Right? It's not like we're all sitting around going, man, did you hear Nat King Cole's version of gratefulness with a thankful heart? Why? Again, I submit to you, we're at war. The enemy and our flesh do not like thanks. And they definitely don't like thanksgiving. And they definitely don't like gratitude. Gratitude is so valuable. Why is it so difficult? I think it's because we have to engage it. We have to take it and hit it head on. We have to have practices in our life that point us to and cause us to be grateful. Uh, Miss Susan Wickware, my mother-in-law, some of you may know her. She told me recently that, or told our, our uh, gospel community recently about a women's group she's a part of. They meet weekly, and throughout the year, they've been writing down things they're thankful for. Um, and just this last week, right here before Thanksgiving, um, the host uh, pulled the jar out, and they read all the things they were thanks thankful for, and then she gave back those notes to the ladies who wrote uh, those things that they're thankful for. I, I love this idea, and as your gospel community uh, uh, pastor, steal that idea. <laughs> gospel communities, I'm telling you right now, you, you want to change the culture of your gospel community quickly? Mark your time with thanksgiving. Mark your time, and don't just say, oh, I'm thankful for this. Write it down. Write it down, stuff it in a jar, and then next year at this time, pull those things out and read it. And may you find in it the joy of the Lord. And get deep with it. Don't be superficial. Don't be surfacy. Oh, I'm thankful for my dog. I'm thankful. You might be thankful for your dog. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for my house. Don't take the 12-year-old approach to Thanksgiving, all right? The Lord healed me. The Lord saved me. The Lord rescued me. Fill in the blank. The Lord delivered me from my enemy. The Lord, the Lord delivered me from this illness. The Lord, the Lord sent my dad home to be with him. And I'm thankful that he is no longer in pain. I'm thankful that he no longer experiences the effects of ALS on his body. I'm thankful that the Lord has saw fit to call him his kid. And he's now dancing with good legs. With magical legs, if you will. 
Get practical about gratitude. That's how you do it. You got to get practical. You got to write it down. You got to you got to make statements to the Lord. You got to thank him. And it can be little things. It can be things that you're just like, Lord, I'm just thankful today I woke up. God, I'm thankful I got clothes to wear. I'm thankful I got a house to live in. God, I'm thankful I'm telling you the list can go on and on. Five ways to develop an attitude of gratitude and I'm going to about to be done, all right? Five, five ways. And I, I got this from uh, some website, I'll be honest with you, right? I didn't come up with these on my own. But I liked them. I liked them enough I want to share them this morning and give time to them. One, appreciate everything. Appreciate everything. Oh, church, what, what would it be like if we did that? You know what I'm saying? If we appreciated everything, oh, that's too much. Appreciate everything. Two, express gratitude every day. Set aside time in the morning, in the evening, midday, whatever works for you. And just be thankful. Make a list. Make a list till you can't think of anything else. Make a list till your hand cramps up. I don't know. Make a list. Set a timer. I say for, for three minutes, I'm going to write things I'm thankful for. List them out. Surround yourself with gratitude, mindset-focused people. And y'all probably know some people out there who just complain about everything. I got two of them living in my house. You know who you, you, know who you are. And it's just, that's, it's just the season we're in right now, right? You go against entitlement when you get around people who are grateful for things. Some of the poorest people I know are the most joyful people I know because they're thankful for everything. Take ownership of your present. You're the owner. Take ownership of it. Take, be deliberate about what you're doing and how you're going to give thanks. You can't change the future because the future's not here yet. Be in the present and own the present. And the way to own the present is have an attitude of gratitude. Five, commit to a gratitude practice. Commit to it. Commit to a gratitude practice. Write some stuff down. Maybe you're a voice to text person. Maybe you're, you like to record yourself on Snap, Facebook, whatever. Like, go for it. So let's practice some gratitude right here at the end. All right? I'm, I'm well over my time, but I want to do it. Things we can be thankful for as a church. 2022, so here's 22 things. Rapid fire. Number one, you. I'm thankful for you. Worship through song. Three, a gospel-centered, biblically faithful pastor, Alexander Wade. Four, a place to meet out of the elements. We're not out in 30-degree weather right now, guys. We're warm with coats on. Awesome. Some of you are sleeping. Uh, five, kids ministry. Six, coffee donuts. Seven, Tithes and offerings. Eight, faithfulness to, of the Lord. He's faithful to us. Nine, the women's ministry. Ten, hopefulness in the Lord's provision for the future. Eleven, mercy. Twelve, justice. Thirteen, baptisms. Fourteen, salvation. Fifteen, grace. Sixteen, orthodoxy. Seventeen, doxology. Eighteen, the Father's everlasting love. Nineteen, his goodness. Twenty, his son. Specifically, his love. Twenty-one, the setup team, grateful for you, literally in my notes, because I wrote it down when I did my sermon prep. And 22, the sound guys, because without you, I would not sound good. So it's that easy, 22 things. It took me like two seconds to write those things down. That's not true. It took me a little longer. But make lists. Stick them in your Bible. Stick them in your journal. Stick them where you can see them. Put... 2020, we had this practice at our house where we just got tired of complaining about stuff. So we made a wall of sticky notes, and we just wrote things each day that we were thankful for, and we stuck it on our wall. And they'd start to fall off or do whatever, but, but we had them visually to see, hey, there's a lot to be thankful for. There's a lot. There's a lot to be thankful for in the Lord. And I'll end with this, Psalm 136. Listen and meditate on these words. Let this be a prayer of our people. Psalm 136, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
His steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Perhaps you might want to join in on the, for his steadfast love endures forever. I don't know. It could be a thing. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. The moon and stars to rule over the night. Oh, give thanks to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through it the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings. Sion, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as, an inher- as a heritage. A heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate. And rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh. All together. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen and amen and amen. We come to our time in our weekly worship where we do the very thing that is said here. We give thanks for what Christ has done, for his steadfast love endures forever. We come to the time of communion, to the Lord's table. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed... He actually gave thanks to the Lord. And I believe Jesus knew what was coming too when he gave thanks. So we're going to read from Corinthians and we're going to participate in taking of the Lord's Supper together. I want to tell you that the Lord's table uh, is a place for believers. So if you've trusted in Jesus, uh, you may come to the table and participate. If you've believed in Christ, uh, you are part of the family. You're not just Worthy Redeemer Church members can come to the table here. Uh, However, if you've never trusted in Jesus, uh, we would tell you this is not a time for you. This is a time for you to observe. This is a time for you to think and contemplate uh, whether or not you need to be part of God's family. We would say yes. We would want you to come to the table. However, uh, if you've not trusted in Jesus, this time is not for you. So... Reading from First Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take, take the bread, take it in remembrance of Christ. Take and eat. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Dear church, let's proclaim. Father, we thank you for this day you've given to us. We will rejoice and be glad in it. May our thankfulness and our thanksgiving give us an attitude of gratitude this, at this time and the days to come that 
we will be a people marked by joy because we're a grateful people. God, may we express our great joy in your son, Jesus, who at the center of all this has given us everything we need for life and for godliness, has given us a relationship with you through salvation. And God, as we head into the time and the days ahead that we celebrate the advent of this newborn baby king, Jesus, who is coming, may we be reminded that we are people who are grateful, who are thankful for what Christ and the Father has done for us and on our behalf. And make us this kind of people. In Jesus' name.